All right, and we're live. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of No Capes. Uh, I'm here with Chris Fidal, I think. I said that yeah, right? You got Fidal. it. Great, awesome. Um, and we are going to talk about some of the amazing things that you have done and are doing. Sweet, amazing. Uh, amazing, just absolutely fantastic. So the first thing I, wanna, I wanted to ask you is, um, how did you get your start as a developer? Ooh, how did I start? Um, I started, I guess I started late. I started after college. Um, I kind of, like, I had this internship in college, and it was at a corporation, kind of like one of the big corporations where I was an intern, and I pretty much hated it. Like, I didn't do anything but, like, make a spreadsheet, and it wasn't even, like, every day. Well, there were some days where I was just sitting there not doing work because there's just no one gave me work. Um, so that, like, I just immediately did not want to do, like, what my major was for, which was kind of, like, a business degree and that kind of stuff. So I started doing, like, programming-type stuff and actually kept doing that after I graduated. So um, it was real. I was, like, what, how old are you when you graduate? 21 or 22 or something when I really started, like, actually learning programming. Um, yeah, I've done some HTML stuff when I was a kid, but really... Uh, really kind of like a late a late start in like Hacker News terms of prodigy development <laughs> or whatever. So so you weren't, you know, doing this stuff when you were an no. infant? No, not out of the womb development. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So what, what did you major in? Uh, information systems. So it was IT related, but um, more management and less actual technical skills. Okay. Okay, so do you remember what your, your first project was developing? Um, God. Uh, okay, so everything we did was like in a .NET thing. And of course, I had no concept of what that was at the time either. So it was like click and drag to make checkboxes. And something you click on connects it to a database, whatever a database is you know, at the time. And it just like kind of works. So like our first projects were like putting together little like UIs that just like asked you questions, stored some information, and then like spit out a report or something like that. So I think I made like maybe like a pizza delivery order thing, um, something like that. I, God, I think there's something like that in college. Um, yeah, that would have to be it. It was something like that. Nice. Pizza delivery, solving the, the big problems. Right, so if Pizza Hut ever wants to pay me a lot of money, I've done something like that before. <laughs> There you go, relevant skills. <laughs> um, okay, so here's an interesting question. What do you think is your biggest success story? Uh, wow. Um, all the stuff I did leading up to working at Userscape and then like Service for Hackers, I've, I've liked that a lot. Um, so like, I don't know if this is what the question is asking, but this is kind of how I think of it because like, I started blogging a while ago, picking up Laravel and that kind of thing. People retweeted it, um, which is great. And, you know, people just saw the stuff I wrote in the Fidel per blog I have. Um, and that eventually led to working at Userscape and working with Taylor and all that kind of stuff. Um, and some other stuff around the same time led me to starting to uh, playing with servers. So really, that whole, uh, I don't know, journey of, of just, like, doing that stuff is, is my success story, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> So what I like doing, I like it a lot, so I like it. Okay, so you, you mentioned servers for hackers, and when I think of you, I kind of think of you as that server guy. Sweet. Um, so That's a shame, because I don't know what I'm doing. Well, if you were going for that server guy, you, you achieved it in my book. Sweet. So, um, what kind of inspired you, I mean, you talked a little bit about the journey, but what inspired you to make servers for hackers? Yeah, um, <clears throat> there were, so I, before Userscape, I worked in a marketing place um, for like five or six years, and there were so many times where like a server would break or something would go wrong, and I just would not have any clue what to do. Um, especially in one case, we were doing kind of a big project, and the servers had like a load balancer, and we were using Rackspace, and they kind of put it all together for us. But I had no idea that, you know, there are consequences of that, so like um, like shared session storage, so that like people weren't logged in in one server, and then the load balancer bounced them to the next server, and they weren't logged in anymore because the sessions were like saved on one server or something. Um, all that kind of stuff. 
you know, some Apache would break and I would have no idea how to fix it. Or um, or even like local development things, we're using MAMP and MAMP didn't have a dependency or something. And it, you know, nothing would go right. And you'd spend a day just like figuring out this one little thing so you could like tweak something on a website that should have taken 10 minutes. Just like a whole series of that kind of thing happened. And then that's where I really started learning more server stuff because it just kept you know, biting me. I just, I just couldn't get any work done, like, consistently all the time. Okay, so pretty much, like, the story of my life. Sweet. Um, <laughs> only you did something about it, and <laughs> this great um, learning tool from it. Yeah. Um, and you've recently published the Service for Hackers book. Yeah, which is great. Um, I used a lot of the same content from the newsletter, and then I added some more just stuff I've picked up and then did a bunch of research. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I mean, that kind of just came together pretty nicely because I had, at the point when I started writing the book, I had, I've been doing some of the server stuff enough on my own time or, you know, at work and that kind of thing. And um, I realized there wasn't really, like, a good resource out there for people who are like me, which is, like, a PHP developer um, and not, like, a hardcore developer because, you know, mm -hmm. my angle of learning programming, PHP was, you know, A, late in life, I don't have a computer science degree, um, you know, so, like, I started doing PHP not really knowing what the whole scope of programming was, uh, you know, WordPress and that kind of thing, and a lot of content management systems. Um, and where was I going with that? Ooh. Your uh, book? <laughs> um, there wasn't a good resource. What's that? There wasn't a good resource for... Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. So, <laughs> so there wasn't a good resource of, like, Someone like me who didn't really have this base set of skills and knowledge of what like was happening on a server and that kind of thing. Um, like a lot of the stuff you read is either kind of like way up here where you need like this base knowledge to figure out, or you know it's just like dives in on this specific topic and the information not really might might not be like up to date or relevant anymore, or might be on some flavor of Linux you've never heard of. Um, you know, so there's all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to just try to make stuff easier um, and get a lot of content out there that was basic on the topic and the kind of stuff that a web developer like myself would need. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff, like people could be doing network security or something, and that's an entirely different book from anything I've written about or even know about. Okay. So this is kind of, uh, as you, I mean, pretty aptly typed, servers for hackers. Um, and I, I like that approach. I like that approach a lot. It's not necessarily for a, a server guru, but for someone like a lot of us, I think, who are, are, are good at what we do and then need to, from necessity, occasionally branch into servers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, how long did it take you to write your book? Mm, well, um, there's two parts of that. I guess writing took maybe two or three months. Um, or that's more like putting it together because the newsletter I think I had out for maybe s four or five or six months at that point. And I reused, I reused a lot of the content on that and kind of expanded on it. So I had a good base of content already. So that was just more like editing and then adding some extra chapters. Um, so probably like two or three months of actual, you know, from when I decided to do it till I finished it. Okay, what was your biggest challenge there? Hmm... I think, well, the two things, two hardest things are, like, actually getting the information on the page in a way that makes sense, which is, like, a lot of revisions and writing and using things like the Hemingway app, um, which just tell you which sentences might be, like, too complex, and you can kind of simplify it and make the grading re-level down. It's kind of like a gamified thing that makes you, like, make your writing simpler, which I like a lot. Um, and then, of course, there's stuff, like learning stuff you don't know, because I, I didn't want it to really be just PHP, so I was branching out into some Python stuff and, like, a little bit of Ruby stuff, mostly, like, also the Python angle, because hosting a Python application is kind of different from a PHP application in the, the tools you have to use. So I wanted to learn more about that and not, like, be really siloed into, like, just PHP developers. Okay, so... Um reaching a broader scope. Yeah. Was that your your first um, encounter with Python? No, wow. no, I've, I've used Python for other stuff. Um, never full time, but for some tooling stuff, and I've used like Django maybe once, but I've um, used um, 
the framework whose name I can't think of because I'm on air, obviously. Um, but whatever, this, the smaller Python framework is. <laughs> I forget. I've used it a bunch, but of course I forget the name now. I, I am not even going to try to guess because I'll just look funny. Um, so moving on, uh, what advice would you have for somebody who would want to write a book? What could you tell someone? Um, I, I think the hard part is getting content. So slowly gathering content over time is like definitely a good thing to do. Uh, what I've started doing, especially with the server stuff, this kind of works out nicely. Um, I'll make like a markdown file whenever I'm doing anything new, and I'll save every command I write, and that turns into a blog post really easily, or you know a chapter in a book, because then you know you have the steps to complete uh, something, a task of some kind, and then the rest is kind of like filling out an explanation of of what those steps are doing. So that becomes kind of a handy way to write. Um, to write, you know, you have like this base of how to do something, and you just got to fill in the explanation part. Okay, yeah, I like that approach a lot. I, I don't know how applicable that would be to non-server-related things, but I think it yeah, be right, that's true. I mean, it kind of works for that. Programming is a lot harder because there's like such a conceptual part of that too, where you need to, um, I don't know, like you know, there's no one way to do it, what to get a task done, or anything like that. Right. Um, so you, you know, you you've been blogging for a while, and then you do an email newsletter, and then you've written a book. Uh, what are the differences, do you think? Are there differences in the way that you need to write in those different mediums? I sort of. I mean, I try to. I guess I try to be less verbose with the server stuff. Um, there's just, there's like, there's less ways to go about doing something in certain, some circumstances, so maybe that just makes it more like easier to write that way. Uh, we're programming, there's a lot of like meta stuff. Like, you know, if your point of view on life in programming is this, then like this blog might make sense, but you might write a completely different way for people who think in a different way. Or like even topics, like WordPress development versus like symphony development are just very different things. So I guess there's um, more of a focus on the server side of things that lends itself to being like less verbose or less wordy and uh, Maybe even like less artful in how you write stuff, you know? I don't know. It's all about the explanation, and getting stuff done. It's not about the art of it. Yeah, that, I mean that makes sense. I think there's a little bit less um, nuance and opinion when it comes to servers. Right. I mean, maybe. I'm sure someone disagrees with that statement. I don't. <laughs> but... I'm sure. Let's see. Am I getting Twitter scam over that? No. Nobody's screaming yet. So. Yeah. Right. Not yet. We'll, we'll see. stand by for that. Um, so here's a question that, that came in earlier from Ross Tuck, and I liked it. Um, why do developers suck at servers? Oof. Um, well, PHP especially, and this is why I wanted to write for PHP developers mostly, um, you just get away with not having to know it. You know, you have a server and Apache is on it, or you download Map or something, and everything just works for the most part. You don't have to know or care, you know, why PHP works just magically in Apache like it does or can. Um, you just, you know, there's, that's just, it gets treated like a file, which is weird. Like PHP is just this file on your server, and it's just like a JavaScript file or a CSS file. It just gets read in and parsed. And you can even put it inside of your HTML, and it just works. Uh, you can't do anything like that, really. I mean, there's probably some exceptions, but you can't really do that with other languages. So you're stuck installing stuff and then figuring out how to hook it up to a web server and, you know, make an application out of it. And in PHP, you just put in a file and just it outputs whatever you want. So you just get away so much. You don't need to learn, you know, how to install a server, especially if you use something like MAP. Um, so, you know, and, and I'm kind of generalizing because I don't know if, like, Python developers suck at servers. I imagine they do less because there's, like, this overhead of, getting Python to work and using virtual env and like all this best practice type stuff that is hard to avoid in, uh, in like Python or Groovy. Okay, so a lot of reasons <clears throat> I think that, that people choose PHP is because it does have such a, a quick uh, learning curve, if you will. You can pretty much hit the ground running with it, but that kind of becomes a double-edged sword in that you don't 
necessarily yeah. walk away. Yeah, exactly. Walk. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you recommend? <clears throat> excuse me. A single resource for reluctant system administrators besides your book or blog? Probably. I okay. So I mean, I wrote it thinking in part that there wasn't a lot of resources, um, but there definitely are some. I I pay attention to the DevOps Weekly newsletter, um, just devopsweekly.com, um, and God, what else? Uh, oh, of course, DigitalOcean's blog. They have so much information. If you have like a specific need, you can just Google DigitalOcean, you know, Apache PHP FVM, or no, Nginx PHP PHP FVM, or whatever, and you know, there's an article on it. Um, you know, even some relatively complex stuff like recompiling Nginx um, or setting up like database replication. There's a, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Awesome. So that's a, a good. I did not realize that DigitalOcean. Um, had such a good blog. Yeah, I know. They're, I mean, they're, it's like a content marketing strategy for them, but it works out for everyone because they have such good information on there. Oh, cool. I will definitely have to check that out. Um, so here's something that came in on Twitter. And I apologize, but I, I don't trust myself to pronounce their name. So a very lovely gentleman on Twitter um, has asked, um, would you give some motivational words for people who follow your work and ideas? Um, oh. <laughs> what? Do uh, you have any motivational words for people who, who follow the things you do? Oh, man. I am so sarcastic. I don't, how does motivation work? I, I think it's like carpe diem. Um, that's a good one. Um, Google every question you have. Google all the things. This is how I learned. This is my career is based on Google. Um, I've actually considered putting that on my resume quite frequently. Like, right, um, great, great at Google. Strong Google foo. <laughs> 90% um, of being a developer. Wow. I mean, I get most of my ideas through work, like issues that I have through um, work. Oh my god. All right. So maintenance people are knocking on my door and I think they have a Hey, come on in. Oh, I'm sorry. One second. We will shortly return to our previously scheduled programming. Do we do we do? Okay. So I get to improv for a minute, I guess. Oh, no, nope, right. he's back. I think we're good. Okay, good. Yay, I'm really um, bad at improv so I'm glad that you're back. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, there's, like, a problem with our air conditioner, and um, so someone are just here to check it out. Oh. You do realize that it's December, yeah? Yeah, no, but I'm in San Antonio, so it's amazing. The AC is on. I have a T-shirt on under this. It was 70 yesterday and sunny. It was amazing. Hmm. I, yeah, I'm fine. I can't. I can't do a hot. You can all be jealous. It's cool. Don't worry about it. Okay. I'll just keep that <laughs> okay. Um. So I already asked you what you felt your biggest success story was. So here's the flip side of that. What do you think your biggest failure has been? Failure and/or mistake, flub. Wow. I don't know. Um. You know. You know what a good failure is? Is how often I don't get picked to speak at conferences. I. <laughs> I submit to. It. Which might be an appropriate uh, topic for an OK, so I guess. Um, which actually isn't a lot, just mostly because I'm scared to actually submit to a lot of, a lot of talks. Um, I, you know, finding a good topic and then making it interesting to people, I feel like is not my strength. Uh, you know, and talking in general is just not my strength, which is why I write so much instead of doing it. OK, so you lost my train of thought. Just a moment. <clears throat> Speaking of speaking, um, I actually have seen you speak, and I think you do a well a, a swell job at that. So thanks, um, appreciate it. That's all up there in your hair, apparently. Well, I, mean, um, I hope so. See, I <laughs> practice a lot for the Laracon talk, so I mean to the point where I might have over practiced because I was, uh, or maybe the topic was too big. You know, I don't, I don't know if I like if I would do that talk the same way again at all. I'd probably try to like focus in on something, whereas I try to talk about a lot of stuff that has a lot of like implications. So speaking of your talk at Laracon, 
have you decided how to properly pronounce hex, hexagonal? 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 I think, hexagonal? I think the way I just said, hexagonal. Hexagonal, okay. It's actually um, a thing where it'll pronounce it for you online. And, you know, it's like a robot voice, but that's it says hexagonal. <laughs> so it's just, hexagonal, well, okay. It work. So you, you said you practice a lot for that talk. What does practicing look like for you? Um, so I would... I can't practice like talking to a person, actually getting feedback, which is probably what you should do, but I don't. I'm too embarrassed to actually talk in front of someone um, like that, like you know, like where I'm like the person with authority speaking to someone. Um, so practicing would be no one else is in the house and can hear me. That's like the only times I could do it. And then uh, it would just be going over the talk. So I'd even actually, like, if you saw me in Laracon, I kind of paced a lot. That's because when I practiced, I just walked around the room the whole time. And I would just, like, go to the computer to hit the next button on the next slide and, like, do that slide and that kind of thing. So I would actually, like, do the whole, you know, 40 minutes or so of what it was. So I actually got the timing down that way. But I, um, um, I don't know, the whole process is, like, embarrassing to me. So I was just... I just practice alone and um, kind of methodically go through the the talk. So I mean, which is like good, I guess, because it prepped me for the talk a lot. And then I didn't speak too quickly and that kind of stuff. But I felt like the talk could have been more exciting. Like it could have like been less monotone, maybe. Okay, um, I found it pretty exciting. But Ooh, thanks. So how how long does it take you to to prepare a talk? So that talk was the longest one I've done. Other ones I've done have been meetup groups and that kind of thing. Um, so, and those have been all good because there's like beer involved and there are like 10, 15, 20 minute talks. Uh, but a bigger talk, like I, I was doing that for like a month ahead of time. Um, probably a little more than a month I was actually writing it, the slides and that kind of thing. And then maybe like three weeks I was practicing like every day, every other day. Um, just whenever I could, whenever there was like, probably like before work ended and or after work ended and before like um, a girlfriend came home from work, it would just be like me doing that practice. Did you uh, involve any stuffed animals? I know a lot of people no, do that. No, stuffed animals. No. I actually, I, I, just, I mean, I don't <clears> have any kids yet, and that might be part of this, but I just refuse to have stuffed animals in my house because they're staring at me. I don't want them staring at me. Not even like an elephant. And I actually don't own any elephants, PHP elephants. Um, I probably should fix that if I can. I actually don't know how to get one. Um, I know that Raphael just did a, a Amsterdam PHP elephant, yes. <clears throat> and you can um, also buy a PHP women elephant if you want a purple one. Sweet. Um, I got two of them at uh, True North and. As soon as I got home, they were promptly absconded with by my children. So <laughs> I went from no elephants to two elephants back to no elephants. Yeah, right, right, of course. But, um, okay. What is the coolest tech thing you have seen recently? All right, so um, recently, and I think this goes along with one of the other questions listed, um, I've been trying to get into like high availability type stuff, which is automating as much as you can and then automating for failure. So if something fails, like another server spins up and replaces it. Um, I was playing with Console, which is made by HashiCorp, um, the guys who sponsor the guy who makes Vagrant. Um, and Console is a service discovery thing, program. So I figured out a way to make Console um, know that there's a load balancer and know when there's a new server and it kind of like announces itself to the load balancer and the load balancer auto adds it in or removes it if the server fails. Which is kind of like, it's kind of a recent thing I was playing with and I'm sure it's like a pretty common thing for like a developer or a, a DevOp person, but for me I was just like, yes! Like, yes! We did this! Um, <laughs> which is lame, but I loved it. So that's definitely a no, recent, a recent victory for me. Yes, and the crowd goes wild. Yeah, exactly. I picture them going wild. Why not? Um, but that was actually a question that we had. Um, Igor asked, um, tell me everything about console because it looks super awesome. So Great. Sweet. Yeah, console, you know, does stuff and things, and it works. 
Um, it uses like the gossip protocol, whatever that is, and surf uh, under the hood to do service discovery, I think, which is another thing that does things. Uh, yeah. So actually, I have a I have a list of um, distributed architecture papers and like blogs and stuff to read and go through, but I haven't yet. So I know they do things, and I know they work, and I know there's a lot of trade-offs, like with the CAP theorem between consistency and availability, and whatever P stands for. Um, but you know, I'm I'm a guy learning how to use this stuff rather than learning how to build them. So. Um, you know, it works and it's awesome, but um, my I'm not ready to like write about it yet. I have more to go. I have more to dig into. Is that coming eventually, though? Can we? Uh, oh yeah, for sure. I'm definitely, I'm definitely, I definitely want to get stuff out of there. I might start doing a bunch of videos on more of these topics because it's a lot easier to show than to write a blog post because the blog posts get really long um, when you have to start explaining how and why these kind of like intricate things are playing with each other. Um, so I'm gonna, hopefully going to start some videos on that kind of thing, on console and service discovery and that whole kind of high availability server stuff is um, definitely a topic I want to dive more into. Awesome. So like screencast type stuff or? Yeah, I hope so. Cool. Very cool. I look forward to that very much. Sweet. Um, and are, are those videos all going to, are you planning on releasing them like as part of the servers for hackers thing or? It'll definitely under be under that name, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I mean, it's not like I have a solid plan or anything. I just know I want to kind of get that information out there. And I think doing some videos will um, actually help me practice speaking just because you have to sit there and speak and explain stuff. Um, and then also just be a good way to disseminate the information. Like, you know, everything on Laracast is awesome. And if I could do a video version of that, that'd be supremely awesome. Um, I'm sorry, a server's version of that. Yeah, definitely. Shout out to... Jeffrey Way for everything he does with Laracast. Um, he's taught me very much on my lunch, and it would be cool to have <laughs> a server's version of that. Um, so you did, you, you kind of circled back around to speaking, and I'm glad you did, because I had one more question, or a few more questions to ask about that. Cool. Um, so you said that your biggest failure is the <clears throat> getting d denied from conferences. Um, so does that happen a lot? I mean, two, three times? Uh, I mean, it, so it's been two or three times, and I think I don't put the effort into it that I should because I'm scared of actually getting accepted, maybe. But, I mean, that assumes that if I put that effort in, I would get accepted. I don't know. But, uh, like, I don't have a lot of um, examples of my work, right? Because I have Lar um, the Laravel conference was like my one kind of longer talk I've done, and I've done some other meetups, but most of them are not recorded. Um, and what else have I done? I mean, and then I have a few videos that are on Vimeo of just some service for hackers stuff I've done that have been part of newsletters. So my thought process to get accepted into some more future ones would be to actually have more links to like talks I've done because I just haven't done that. Everything's been like a description of a of a future talk. Um, so I'd actually, like, I don't know what to put into the, to these CFPs, really. Like, there's there's some stuff out there that tells you, like, how to do it or, you know, to be interesting or uh, not to put stuff that aren't actually talks yet. So I guess that means I have to make talks first, which I'm probably not going to do. I don't know. You know, <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't know. Like, like what do you put in the CFPs? Like, how crazy do you get with a description? Do you know? <laughs> um... Well, I kind of just, I don't know, I aim for the fences usually. Um, I try to be kind of funny and witty and sarcastic because that's how I am. Um, and I figure if I'm going to do this, this talk thing, then I'm going to have fun with it. Um, I mean, I don't know how effective it is, but that's what I do. Um, and I'm, I'm fairly new to the talk circuit too. But, yeah, so that's what I, and, and I feel the same way, that I mean, CFPs are ridiculously hard, and somebody should give a talk on how to give talks and how to submit yeah. talks. Right, that how to submit be. talks, definitely. <laughs> right, that should, uh, I'm going to start submitting I'm, that to, yeah, to talk. Yeah, I have, I have, like, a sentence and some bullet points of what the talk will cover, and, like, maybe the title is interesting, but, like, that's because I'm trying to make it interesting. Uh, but, you know, I think I have a lot of information that people might want to know. I just have to, like, figure out how to get it out there. 
So I don't know. Maybe this will help. Maybe people will see this. <laughs> yes, please. Have Chris Fidel come talk. I can somebody, talk. Somebody, very somebody let me talk, please. Um, and I, I apologize. That was that was a bit of an awkward question asking, you know, how much you've been denied. But I asked it for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I realize after I said it that that probably wasn't the best thing. But Ooh. you know, we do <laughs> we do a lot of talking about um, you know getting accepted and how to get accepted. Um, but on no capes, we haven't really talked that much about the fact that you do get denials. Yeah. Um, right. And I've gotten um, I've gotten them, and it kind of stings a little bit. And it hurts me like oh. Here. Yeah, exactly. But it, I mean, it happens, and I don't think you should let that deter you. And um, I don't think that it, the fear of it happening shouldn't stop you from submitting. Yeah, right. And that's definitely one thing to get over, and just like just do it anyway. Um, I'm really sad. I actually missed the CFP for Dallas PHP. I did want to do that because I'm actually close to it now. But that was right as I was moving to San Antonio, and there's just no way I would have had time to like actually f make a talk or s you fill out the CFP really in a way that would have gotten accepted. Dallas or Lone Star? Lone Star, which is in okay. Dallas. Right. Sorry. Okay. I wasn't sure if there was another Texas conference. No, no, you're absolutely there. right. I didn't do the. I didn't say the right name at all. Yeah. Um, well, I think Lone Star PSP is put on by the Dallas PSP user group, I believe. Oh, cool. Okay. I, I could be wrong about that, but um, that's the. I at least should go to that. I have no excuse not to just like drive a few hours up to Dallas. Yes, you should definitely go, and then live tweet it because I can't drive all the way across the country for it. So. <laughs> Do that. Um, okay. So your your talks are you are you submitting talks about this this cool servers for hacker stuff or is that yeah yeah so everything's been kind of on the server side of stuff um, I haven't submitted any more ta talks for hexagonal architecture or domain driven design or any, or anything like that because um, I haven't actually done like like I've done a bunch of it but I don't like practitioner it enough where I have like this useful experience but um, like I do with the server stuff because I'm just doing server stuff a bunch. On my spare time or for work, because we have some servery stuff going on. Um, so I haven't submitted talks for like the code angle kind of stuff, just because I haven't really been mindfully like practicing like new code techniques lately. Lately, being like last since last like six months more. Okay, so. I would definitely love to hear you speak. So, any conference organizers? Organizers. Organizers, speaking are hard. <laughs> Conference organizers who are watching this, um, definitely get Chris to come speak about servers because I want to see that. And I think a lot of other people do too. And um, even though I can't pronounce words today, please accept me to speak too. Right. Um, no, I'm forgetting things like words, like Python frameworks. I swear I will. <laughs> when I do a talk, probably. <laughs> even though words are hard, I promise I can <laughs> give talk. Um, so, okay, okay, question. So, I think most people know um, that you work for um, Userscape, building Snappy and HelpSpot. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that one of the avenues that kind of brought you into Userscape was um, some of the blogging you had done and then Laravel development. So, yeah. how did you get into Laravel and why Laravel? Um, when did I get into it? So I was hopping into Laravel in Laravel 3, and I think 4 was just starting to get to be a beta when I was um, discovering it. So I did like a play app in Laravel 3 and realized how much I loved it over Coding Nighter, which is the other framework um, I used at work a bunch. Um, so we, so I started learning that, and I actually used it at work once or twice for some smaller projects that were kind of like contests and that kind of thing. Um, so, how long ago was that? That was maybe like two years ago now. Or I mean, I guess I was right at the beta of Laravel, so however long that was, however long ago that was. Um, and then I just hopped right into the beta, like as soon as it was available, and started learning, like, you know, how that stuff worked. And I read the code a lot. Um, for whatever reason, at the time, I got motivated to read as much of that code as I could. So whenever I saw a lot of these questions of like, you know, facades, what is that? And um, just 
what else, you know, like service provider type stuff. Like, that was all new to me, so I was learning what that was. Um, so, like, just as I was on the cusp, it was kind of like the right time for me to learn all these programming concepts, and then I found Laravel, and then that just, like, expanded and blew up my knowledge of it, because all of a sudden I learned, you know, about service providers and that whole pattern of stuff, and how that's loosely coupled, and testing came along at that point, um, you know, for me personally. Uh, so then I just started blogging a lot about it because there was all just all this like little useful things that I had figured out in my own time, and I figured you know why not blog about it? Um, and that started getting picked up when I tweeted about it on Twitter. So Twitter, Twitter's good for careers, I guess, or something. Um, and that eventually led me to you know finding Userscape, and just, you know that all worked out really well. So. Um, you know, it was kind of like, I guess you could say it was like a content marketing strategy for myself as like a personal brand. Uh, I didn't really see it like that at the time, um, other than knowing that kind of disseminating information other people find useful is a good way to um, get known as a developer on, on, you know, social media or whatever where people can see you and see your expertise and, you know, help your career along. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, I mean, I think that's that is stellar advice. Um, you know, blogging for me is actually kind of scary sometimes, um, simply because you're you know you're putting yourself out there. Um, but I think it's it's definitely well worthwhile, and a lot of people underestimate the amount of um, personal branding that can come just by having a blog. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And okay. it's just useful to have, like, information available. Like, when I Google some specific thing, if someone else has written about that specific thing, it just makes my day, because that's, like, a half-hour problem instead of a six-hour problem. Oh, definitely. I, I can say, personally, um, I actually, when I first started messing around with Laravel, um, found your blog a couple of different times for, for solving Sweet. problems. So I nice. turned a couple of my six-hour problems into half-hour <laughs> problems. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Vapor Bash. Can you oh, yeah. talk a little bit about, for anyone who doesn't know, what is Vapor Bash? Yeah, so Vapor Bash is a GitHub project. It stands for Vagrant Provisioning Bash Scripts. Um, I spent all of 30 seconds making that name, and it's probably a really terrible name because it's so hard to pronounce and spell, but there it is. Um, so I've gotten into Vagrant. Um, finally, and realized how awesome it was. Um, and I also hate installing things on my Mac. Like, I don't like treating my Mac like a development machine. It's just kind of like a, a computer, and then I can put development stuff on a server that runs on my computer, and then my Macintosh stays, like, clean. Uh, and I'm a little bit anal about that. So I started using Vagrant a lot, and I, you know, have a lot of virtual machines and that kind of thing. Um, at the same time, I was learning more server stuff and decided to make a quote-unquote easy vagrant thing. Like there's a lot of stuff that uses like Puppet um, or uh, Fansible and that kind of thing. And if you don't know those tools, then you know they can configure stuff for you, but you don't really know what's going on. Um, so Vapor Bash is a series of Bash scripts. And bash scripts are just the commands that you would use otherwise normally inside of a server, um, you know, for the most part. So when you look at a bash script and you can see like how to install nginx and make it work with PHP or something like that, you are seeing like how that's done on an actual server. You're not seeing how like Ansible does that or um, you know Salt or Puppet or Chef. You're not seeing like something that does magic and you don't know what what happened. You're seeing like just how it actually works. So I see uh, Vapor Bash as kind of like a teaching tool um, because certainly if you get into more complex setups and especially anything you use in production, then Vapor Bash is like not the tool for that. Vapor Bash is something for like that's good for development sites or um, development servers, and it's good for kind of like seeing what's going on behind the scenes to see how a server is set up and how specific software is installed and configured. Okay, so. Vapor Bash kind of then takes the place of, of like, a, a Fansible or a Puppet? Yeah, 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 it can. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't use them together, I guess, is also a, a way to word that. <clears throat> um, but I do use Fansible. I love Ansible a lot, so Fansible is, like, right up my alley, too. Um, 
and all the other stuff like um, like Homestead. Like I don't see Homestead as like a competitor or anything. Cause Homestead is I use Homestead for any Laravel project actually, <laughs> and um, Vapor Batch for other stuff because um, it's so focused and nice. Everything kind of like just works with it. Um, so yeah, you know, use the right tool. Yeah, I use. I mean, I use Homestead uh, quite a bit for lots of different random things that can all live happily on the same box. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So I definitely do like that, and it's very easy and simple. Um, and I, I've looked at Fansible, and I've looked at Puffet. Um, I haven't actually played with Vapor Batch. Horrible me. Apologies. Uh, <laughs> but I think I will, because I, I do like the idea of not just make it do this magical thing that I need it to do now, but make it do the thing and then let me see how it did the thing. Yeah, I mean, I use it for reference. I go back and copy and paste stuff from it to my own, you know, if I'm installing something or writing a blog or something, you know, I just go like, oh, yeah, how did I configure that? You know, and I just look at it. Right. I mean, yeah, it's, like you said, a good, it's a good teaching tool and a good reference and also something that's functional and usable, too, which is a plus. Right. Um, and someone on Twitter, by the way, says that Vapor Bash is a great name. Sweet. And Thanks. I, agree. I don't, I don't uh, ask his name either. Uziel? We'll see. Yes. Maybe he'll yes. tell us. Yeah, I, no. um, also, um, are you a musician? We see the guitar in the background. Oh, um, okay. So I own a guitar, and I can play it. Am I a musician? Yeah, I don't know. Um, and actually, it's like I know the guitar like I know programming-ish. Meaning, I can play scales, and I know like some music theory and kind of stuff, but I know very few songs. Like, I only know how to play a few actual songs. So, like, supposedly, I have this good base of knowledge to be a really good guitar player, but I just like haven't taken the extra step. Um, and I don't know. Is that like my programming career? Maybe. Maybe not. Actually. I was gonna say that. Not quite catching the analogy, but. I don't know. Okay. Um, um, because like uh, because like domain design knowledge is like this good base set of knowledge, but I only actually use that pretty rarely, and I definitely have not made like a fully uh, DDD'd out app that does like all of the concepts of like what that can encompass. Um, so maybe that's what I was thinking. I don't know something. Okay, so you have the knowledge, but you haven't necessarily put it into practice. Yeah, let's go with that's, that. There's an analogy. <laughs> we made it. Um, speaking speaking of DDD, um, you did give a talk at Laracon in New York about hexagonal architecture. Yeah. Um, and we had a question about um, how did you, how did you get into DDD and what was your experience? With that? Um, I started reading books like some of the the Bible-y type books, like the they're not in the bookshelf behind me, but um. The things like refactoring and clean code and um, principles of enterprise, whatever, whatever, whatever. I forget. I always forget. Uh, I forget the acronym, too. Um, and then that all leads down this path of... Um, that all, like, like all roads lead to domain-driven design if you are really studying these high-minded um, coding principles. And that led me down the path of getting the blue book and then the red book um, so what's that, Evan's DDD book, and then I forget the other guy's name who did the red book. Um, and I've read, I don't know, three quarters of both of those books. <laughs> I didn't finish them. Um, because I wasn't, like, practicing it as I was reading it, so but that would take, like, some real effort. Um, but I was getting into the concepts of writing code um, that reflected the business logic and not writing code that reflected getting information in and out of a database. Um, so that was kind of like mind expanding. I really love that idea. In practice, like it's I don't do that in like a full time job context because uh, one I work in Help Spot. Help Spot is like a nine year old project, and that didn't exist in PHP nine years ago. So um, you know that whole movement of domain driven design just like wasn't really around, uh, and it wasn't coded in that fashion. So it, I'm my day to day full time isn't a place where I. Um, can do like domain driven design type stuff. I mean, you know, I could fit it in here and there and try to ha have um, kind of improve the code base there, but um, because of that 
I don't consider myself like an expert on the subject at all, or even like a hardcore protection pr practitioner of it. Um, but I have made a good study of you know reading the books and and that kind of stuff. Um, so my talk hexagonal architecture um, isn't domain driven design, but it can coincide with it. So like the the very center of that hexagon was like where you would put your domain driven stuff. It was the the domain, and then the other layers are kind of how to structure your application code and um, framework if you use a framework around that from like a structure point of view, or how to treat it so that they don't end up depending on each other. So you know it's uh, it's like the inversion of control concept is a heavy concept in hexagonal architecture where each layer is not really dependent on an outside layer is dependent on only layers inside of it and how do you make that a reality and that kind of thing. Um, so hexagonal architecture is kind of like a thing that just works with it uh, with domain driven design but isn't necessarily domain dri driven design actually. Okay, so sure. I misspoke a little bit there. but um, No, I don't think you even said that but I think that's a confused topic. I agree, but it's it's a pretty big topic to to understand. Um, in your your research and your learning about um, DDD and hexagonal architecture, which are not the same thing, <laughs> um, do you know of resources in the community? Um, you, know, you said you don't consider yourself to be an expert or even a, a practitioner, but can you point at some people who might be that we could? Yeah, um, Matthias. Um, what's his last name? Veritas, something like that. Sorry, I hope you're not listening and hear me butchering, butchering your name completely. Um, I don't know, various, I forget. He knows everything about everything. Um, <laughs> so, because I think he's actually practicing it in, in his day-to-day -day, day -day job. He's both teaching it and doing it at work as much as he can. So I think that combined experience of teaching and doing makes him a really good resource to go to to ask questions and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have caught several of his blog posts. Yeah, um, and they're really good. And I won't. Um, I mean, other resources are like reading the books. The books are pretty heavy, but um, you know, they get you an idea of it. But like, practicing it versus reading about it is definitely really different because there's a lot of stuff to wrap your head around. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's one of those concepts that it. I you know I've read parts of the red book and the blue book um, at different times trying to really um, grok this concept and you can read the books and feel like you really grasp it when it comes time to like put the code down it kind of gets blurry at least for yeah. me oh definitely um, I actually think there is a new podcast of some sort coming out where people will be talking about domain driven design. And I will have to tweet about that later because I can't. Sammy, Sammy K. What's his last name? Hello, Twitter. I don't know your last name. Sorry, Sammy. Even though you've emailed me, I'm sure I should know it. Um, it's going to get me and Matthias and other people who know a lot more than me, like Matthias, about domain driven design. Um, I think sometime in January to talk about it. On PHP Roundtable? Yeah, Roundtable. Awesome. Awesome. Um, and actually, speaking of Sammy K, we had a question from him. Um, how do you make time for blog, book, open source projects, speaking, still do projects for money, and have a job? Um, so everything but work is is everything you listed. Well, actually, open source. So like, oh, I just like don't do open source. <laughs> I mean, I've done Vapor Bash, but like, I haven't really made other projects. Like, I'm not really a maker. Um, like like Hacker News would like to say, I guess. I learn stuff and I am better, I'm better at learning and teaching and that's kind of more in my range of interests than I am at making new and like innovative stuff. Um, and you know, and everyone loves, you know, making new stuff and that's like, it's fun and it's fun when people use your stuff but, you know, not every, like I, I don't personally come up with these like great ways to, you know, find like a, uh, problem and solve it in like a unique or simple way like like something what Taylor does like a, a, in userscape chat we call it otwelling something when you like Taylor just like 
takes a problem and just makes it like this simple, amazing thing. And that's nothing, that's like not what I do, like where my head's at with stuff. Like I like to learn complex stuff and then teach people how to do complex stuff. I don't, I don't really like simplify. So um, my open source stuff is, is all like te learning, learning other people's projects rather than um, like making stuff. Um, but I mean, in terms of finding time for everything else I do, which, it, which is just like blogging, and that really has turned into service for hackers, which has turned into content marketing and like selling the book. Um, it's hard because I mean that's that's like what I do right now. So it's full time work at Userscape. In the off hours, I'm like learning and doing blogging and stuff, and um, so that's what I focused on right now. So that that's like the two things competing with time. Um, but you know, it helps now that I've moved moved to San Antonio because I don't have any friends. I don't know anybody here. So I go home and I like I'm done with work and I go to the next room and then I take my laptop with me and do my other stuff. Um, so maybe I'll get friends and do less stuff. I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so just um, remove social life and then have fun. Yeah, no, don't have any kind of social life and then you can become all powerful on the internet. <laughs> all right, seems like a fairly easy one-two step, right? <laughs> Definitely, it is. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, content marketing for, for your book and for your newsletter. Um, mm -hmm. And that's generally not, in my experience, something that developers are necessarily strong at. Um, you know, content marketing, what do they call it? It's uh, growth hacking? Is that a thing? Oh, man. Well, I mean, growth hacking is definitely a thing, but I hope that's not what they're doing. So this is another userscape chat thing where we just destroy people who think they're growth hackers. So we like just make fun of that all day long. Um, I don't even actually know what that is. It's not this terrible place where we make fun of everyone. <laughs> but um, Ian being like a bootstrapping guy is like against this growth hacking movement. And I think we all agree where it's just like these weird ideas people come up with to like um, grow their stuff. I don't know, but like I, content marketing is like is like marketing, and that it's just like a like fancy terms for simple things um, where we're just getting content out there and then tweeting about it, and then maybe asking people with a lot of Twitter followers to like tweet your content if they think it's good, you know, something like that. Um, and it's, it's nothing like really more or fancy. Um, I am, I am going to do some fancier stuff with my book where people who sign up for the preview might get like a five to seven chain of emails over a month. They get like little tidbits of information and then I do like hard sells and soft sells and just other kind of stuff in there um, to try to get more people to buy the book. Um, but, you know, that's kind of as fancy as I've gotten. Otherwise, everything is just like the newsletter. I try to write good content for it. And, um, <clears throat> well, I guess that's another thing because a lot of newsletters you get are just lists of links and like a little short blurb of what it is. And I'll like skim through those, but I just never really get through them all because A, there's a lot of newsletters and B, there's not like a focus in the content that's just like, like, like the DevOps newsletter has a lot of good stuff, but I have to sift through all this stuff that I'm not going to read or it's not interesting or, you know, then I have to click out to a link and read it and all that stuff. Whereas I like to write like a good piece of content and just have that be like that week's addition. Um, so, you know, content marketing and marketing yourself in general is about getting good information out there and just making it clear for people. Definitely, definitely agree. Um, you don't, unless you have a good product, there's not a whole lot to market. So, um, oh, that too, focus yeah. on product first, marketing later. Um, I think you did um, omit a crucial step, though, uh -oh. in, in your marketing plan. What's this? You have stickers. Oh my god, I have stickers. Look. Yes, I have a there's sticker a whole, on my laptop. A whole stack laptop. of stickers here. There you go. The Bandy problem is like, distributing them to people. I would have to get like a hundred stamps and like letters and like manually go, like do this. And I just know I just don't know if I'm willing to do that. Yeah, there's no automation process for that, unfortunately. Yeah, um, so somebody, somebody make that and uh, get paid for that. I uh, I actually I, I ship. Um, Hack the Stigma stickers around, and um, you know I love Hack the Stigma, and I love the stickers, and I love disseminating, and the people enjoy showing them off. 
until I realized that, oh, right, I actually have to lick envelopes now? That's a thing? <laughs> and it is. Okay. Yeah, no, that takes real work. And, mm -hmm. like, um, I don't know what that would even be expense-wise for, like, <laughs> stamps. I don't know. And then you're like, and I, I mean, that's a hefty expense. Because what do you get, like, 20 stamps for, like, 10 bucks or something like that? Yeah, I think they're, they're about 50, 50 cents a stamp. It's less than that. No. Oh. I, I don't do maths. That. I do maths like I do speaking. Not well. <laughs> Not well. Um, Not good. Okay. Well, somebody mentioned me in the Laravel off-topic room, but my IRC is broken, so we'll skip that. Um, we're almost out of time, but we do have a couple more questions. Um, namely, what is your favorite Unix command? Um, I use ACK a lot, I think, for searching stuff in text. Excuse me. Um, so you could, um, you could like do something like find and then pipe it to grep and search through files and this fancy thing, or you can just download ACK, A-C-K, um, and just say ACK like in your search term, and it just searches through all the text files in your like current directory. Um, and there's a little more stuff you can do to say, like, specifically PHP files or JavaScript files or something like that. But it's just a really easy way to search through files and find where, like, an instance of some piece of text is, which is actually really useful for programming. Um, I like it better than, like, um, a search in a certain code base, like Sublime or PHP Storm or something like that, because I can just do it one off real quick in the terminal. Um, yeah, I'll go with that. I use that. I use that so much, so I think I should call that my favorite. Okay, so I, I did a quick Google. Is that beyondgrep.com? Um, I think so. It's also called ACK grep. Okay. And, well, it says yeah. ACK on it, and it has a little owl looking. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, that's it, beyondgrep.com. I have not heard of this, but I do often dislike grep, so... Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. There's a there's an easy brew installer for it too. So like I have it on my Mac and I put it on my um my servers too. Oh, it must be pretty pretty cool if it warrants being if installed it, on the if Mac. If it made it to the laptop, store. yeah, it's worthy. If it's on the computer, then it it's a plus. That's a gleaming recommendation for ACK. Okay, well I I'm definitely gonna check it out. Um, Oops, sorry, another question. Oh, <laughs> nope, not a question. Just yes, that's it. So, yay. Hey, um, a... So you mentioned, I believe, PHP Storm. Yeah, I'm a PHP okay. Storm user. I converted. You converted. What did you convert from? Sublime. Okay. Um, so what is what is your normal development environment look like? You've got PHP Storm. You're obviously running Vagrant. Are there yep. any other cool tools you're using? I would be all over Docker if Docker worked on um, my Macintosh kind of like natively. I guess Mac's kernel isn't um, the kernel that Docker can work with, a kernel that Docker can work with. So you'd have to use boot to Docker, which just makes a VM and puts Docker on it. And it makes that workflow pretty nice, but it's not actually having Docker on your Mac. So you don't skip out on... Um, like a virtual machine is a heavy layer of virtualization because it's an entire computer working inside of your computer. And then on top of that, there's like this layer of virtualization also doing work to make your virtual machine think it's like on, um, it has hardware. Uh, whereas Docker is just like this thing that uses your kernel and it's really like the differences. And it's like this little rooted, gelled container inside of your thing and it's lightweight. Um, and I would be, so I would be using that if I could. So like if I had a, an Ubuntu laptop or something, I would just use Docker instead of uh, Vagrant. Um, and I say just, but, you know, it's not like, it, it's, it's weird and there's like definitely a learning curve to get Docker containers to talk to each other. So if you have like a database one and a Nginx one and maybe even a separate one for PHP FBM, um, like that would get a little funky too. But, um, I would be using that, but since Max kernel is a little wonky, I just use Vagrant, um, which is, you know, fine. Um, and PHP Storm, and what else do I use? I mean, that's really the core of it, other than 
Um, tweet deck. I have tweet deck open all the time. <laughs> you use that for development? I use that for development, right? Why not? I don't right. know. Definitely. Um, one last question because we're about out of time, um, but I just want to ask, how many um, virtual boxes do you have running at any given time? No more than two because while I also don't like having a lot of stuff installed on my Mac, I don't like things stealing my RAM either. So I, I, um, I'm general, because I'm generally working on one project at a time, so like I have a decent list of virtual machines, of Vagrant machines that I have created, but, and I tend to do a virtual machine per project. So like my Service for Hackers stuff is one virtual machine. Um, my Fideloper blog is another. Uh, Help Spot at work is one virtual machine. Um, and then I have other stuff, so like we have a build step for um, help spot because there's has to get build and packaged into like a Windows installer and that kind of thing. So that's a whole another virtual machine. So I have a bunch, but I only run one or two at a time, so my system doesn't get too bogged down, and um, you know I don't want things like using all my RAM, the CPU, if I don't have to. Okay, that is definitely a good point. I've I've heard of people running you know, four and five different virtual machines at a time. I usually only run one or two, but I wasn't sure yeah, if I'm sure you can. I'm just kind of too paranoid to do it. If for some reason I think it'll do something bad, I don't know. <laughs> Paranoia. Yeah. Okay, well, we are out of time, and I just want to thank you for coming on. Um, sure. It's been very, Anytime. very insightful. Um, and I appreciate it. And for anyone watching, thank you very much. It's been, it's been real. Cool. All right. See you, everybody.